Here's one you might not have heard of before, and I wanted to talk about it a little bit with you because I'm kind of excited about this, and it's a emergent school of social psychology. It's called Terror Management Theory, TMT for short. Terror Management Theory. Uh, this has been around probably since, uh, for about 20 years. Uh, and maybe the uh, originator of this theory, I believe, was writing in the 1970s when he was getting, he was basically approaching his death. He published a book right, you know, right from his deathbed called The, Den the Denial of Death. And it inspired the terror management theory school of social psychology. Um, which is now publishing a lot, and it's, it's on the upswing in um, psychological research right now. And the concept behind the denial of death is an interesting one, because it postulates that human beings are instinctively afraid of death. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Do you fear death? <laughs> probably the number one fear. And there are all sorts of reasons for that, right? Because you like life, you, you enjoy the pleasure of being alive, you enjoy the, the pleasure of love uh, with your family and, and lovers and mates or whatever, uh, you, that you love a good movie, you like the pleasures of life and of other people. And, you know, so obviously, death threatens that. <laughs> this seems pretty obvious. But let's break down the obviousness of it because I always question what we take for granted, and you should too. So, if we fear death, uh, the, the theorist who wrote The Denial of Death, I believe his name was Ernest Becker, uh, suggested that we spend almost all of our energy lying to ourselves that we're going to live forever. That we construct systems to keep us, to manage our terror of death. And really, he argues, all of human culture is a ruse to make us feel like we could live forever. Now, you might be asking yourself, what? It's not like a pill you can take that would make you immortal. How can that be? Well, the theory is that culture outlives you, does it not? Haven't you learned about culture from vast civilizations, human history, uh, great works of literature, films that were made before you were born, uh, statues that were created before you were born? So culture feels to us like it outlasts our natural human length of life. So we cling to it to manage our fear of death. And we also emulate its heroes so that we can personally feel like we can, we can outlast our own bodies, our own mortality. Even if it's just unconsciously like, uh, with writers, I'll publish this book and it'll live on after me. A great work of literature, something like that. <laughs> uh, we do this. And, uh, so culture is one element that helps us to manage our fear of terror of death, possibility of death. And the other is self-esteem. Self-esteem. We're always building up our own self-esteem as a safeguard, a mental guard against the fear of death. Uh, lurking underneath all of this, of course, is not just that we like to be alive for the pleasures of life, that death sounds scary because it's the unknown. Uh, but that we as human beings are pretty unique in that we can imagine our own deaths. The theory is that, I don't know, a deer in the woods doesn't necessarily think about death very much. It just thinks about, what am I going to eat right now? How am I going to you know, survive the day to live? But it isn't conceptualizing what happens after I get shot. Do I become ghost baby? It doesn't have these. <laughs> there is no deer culture that we know of. There's no religion in the woods where the deers go to pray and worship about an afterlife. This, this is the theory. I could be wrong. I don't know deer culture. I could be wrong. But in theory, the deers have no culture. <laughs> they just eat things and run and get shot by hunters. Okay. How does that relate to the Uncanny Valley? Does it seem logical? How do robots play into this? Well, the one obvious way, uh, 
hope you're thinking this way, is that robots are a part of human culture. And it's sort of like that Frankenstein argument you were making before, that we create them as a way to outlive ourselves. In a way, in a, in a weird, abstract way, it's like a creation that is more human than human, because it's not going to die the way that we die. It's inorganic. It doesn't rot like me, which in theory we do. Good. So, uh, but when they start to look like us, they remind us of death. And because they're inorganic, that drives it home in an uncanny way. Because death is being an inorganic object, an inanimate creature. You can't move. Have you ever seen a dead body? Maybe in a movie, I don't know. Not a walking dead body, but just a dead body. It doesn't have all the trappings of the organic part. So the uncanny valley is that moment that triggers that sense that we're not as safe from death as we thought we were. That's the theory. I think it's interesting because it also supports the Freudian idea, which is about the same idea when it comes to the double or the doppelganger, which is a, you know a mimic, create uh, an alter ego. You know, like I don't know. Rob Lowe and Skinny Arms Rob Lowe. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a novel thing. Yeah, that's a popular identity reference. The commercials use this stuff like crazy. But you can find out more about it in the book, like, you know, so, Yes? Is there any part of this that there's a fear or some idea that we can be supplanted by robots in some fashion? Like they'd have their own culture? Well, that they, they, the idea that they can, in fact, the Theoretically, they could live further because they're machines. Well, we see that in science fiction. So, yes, the, the world of, of artificial intelligence replacing mankind's culture, the, the singularity where uh, the next step in evolution is probably you know, transhuman or robotic androids who have a, a computer minds rather than organic brain tissue, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> yes, we see that in fiction all the time. But in those fictions, the hero is almost always human, or the most human robot. So it plays into that idea of self-esteem and heroism, if you buy the terror management theory. That is that uh, you know, we, don't, we don't like to imagine that a robot could be more heroic than us, unless it's a lot like us. In its behavior, its mannerisms, its ethics. Uh, there are all sorts of issues here that I don't have the time to get into, but it's really fascinating research. Like, you know, there's PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. There's a People for the Ethical Treatment of Robots movement that is interested in this and because it, the, these groups understand that there's something uh, not evil, but othering about what we humans do with things that aren't like us. We treat others as beneath us, below us. So that is the logic of racism. Or you're not like me in your skin color or your, your uh, genetic structure. Therefore, you're worse than me. And that's the same logic that gets applied to robots and androids. And they're not living creatures, but the logic is the same. So a lot of people critique this logic of othering because it's the logic of Hitler, <laughs> right? And so even if it's about something that's artificial, to think in that way is to reproduce something that's not empathetic. I don't know if evil's the right word. It's not empathetic to other human beings. Women? Does that make sense? <laughs>